This video is about reaching space. Specifically, what technologies will provide us the ability to easily, affordably, and routinely reach space? Let's face it, we cannot become spacefaring if it's too difficult and expensive to reach space. Therefore, we must discover novel ways of reaching space. Later in this video, we will be introducing this craft. It's an aerospace craft. It's one that will allow us to master getting into space. In the early 1960s, the great race for space began in earnest. I'm sure we've all heard the stories. By the late 1960s, early 70s, humanity having never before been in space, conceived, built, and sent three human beings into space heading toward the moon. Not that so a few astronauts can have a window seat of Luna, but to land on the moon, and we did just that. We even planted a flag. How about that? Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn for We're pretty busy for a Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. If you think about it, that was an astonishing feat of progress, especially since the needed technologies never existed beforehand. Could we do something similar today? If we put all of our full efforts into another project, say, the AS project, could we achieve such feats once again. In fact, we could, we could far exceed their efforts now that we have the experience, that is, some 50 years later. Mankind is resourceful. If we set our minds to a task, no matter how seemingly impossible it might seem, in time we will indeed overcome it. But haven't we already mastered getting into space? Thanks to the likes of SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Rocket Lab and others, the process of mastering getting into space has begun. Or has it? Sure, we've already landed on the moon several times, have sent numerous probes into space, SpaceX has even achieved reusable rockets and self-landing boosters. But does this actually represent an ability to get into space with relative ease affordably? Are we really any closer to mastering getting into space today than we were 50 years ago? Well, let's dive in and assess it. A number of years ago, a good friend of mine owned a small private plane. Behind his house, he shared a compact airstrip that was able to service a handful of small, single-engine aircraft. At a moment's notice, and I know this because we've already done this, would step out back of his house into a hangar, inspect his plane, push it out of the hangar, perform systems check, start the engine, taxi onto the runway, and when all was clear, take off. 
just like that. Ten miles away was another compact airstrip where another friend was living. There we would often visit him. Basically, this is mastery of air travel. Owning and operating a small aircraft never broke the budget. Let's face it, current means of getting into space require large, massive, powerful, multi-stage chemical rockets, which consist mostly of fuel and propellant. Before they can be launched, they require great weather days, dangerous and expensive fuels and propellants, and containment vessels, well-trained personnel, and expensive, dedicated launch facilities. That and a lot more for one launch just to reach orbit. That's a lot of hoop de doo just to reach space. And if we throw in the mix reaching Mars, well... Before we can reach Mars, that same rocket needs to be refueled and repropellanted, which means tons of fuel and propellant need to be launched into orbit using another one of those massive chemical rockets. In fact, up to 20 times, simply to supply the initial massive rocket with enough fuel and propellant to reach Mars. And once this massive rocket has reached Mars, well, once again, it must be refueled and repropellanted before it can return. This process that requires multiple refuelings in and of itself is highly risky, especially when you consider that typically rockets have a 1 in 600 chance of some sort of failure, whether it's small or major. The question is, is this real mastery of getting into space? Of course not. When you consider how close space actually is, for example, the International Space Station maintains an altitude of only about 400 kilometers above our heads. That is close. A small aircraft like my friends routinely travel roughly equal distances over the surface of the Earth. For the foreseeable future, the cost of reaching space must drop to an affordable level, not likely as low as owning and operating a small personal aircraft, but nonetheless low enough that space travel can become affordably routine. Why? There are several reasons, which includes vast technological progress that will benefit each and every one of us. There is that. However, when you throw in the mix the near future, relatively soon, mastering getting into space and space travel will take on a critical level of importance, becoming, in fact, perhaps even critical to mankind's survival. Let's see what the coming days hold for us. So, now what? How are we going to master getting into space? Well, a good place to start is with an aerospace craft. An aerospace craft is a vehicle that is capable of both reaching and flying in space. And they can take the form of space planes, which is typical, saucers, spheres, triangles, as well as other shapes, with certain specialized technologies. The shape is not too important. In the last decade or so, multiple hyperfast aircraft and space planes have been conceived, drafted, and some commenced work on. As we speak, there are those developing space and rocket planes, and of course, Virgin Galactic makes use of a chemical-powered space plane 
to ferry passengers into space. On one hand, it appears to be relatively simple to build an aerospace craft. For example, if you took an existing hypersonic airframe, replaced its engines with one or more rocket engines, then bolted on fuel and propellant tanks, and launched it from the back of a larger aircraft at altitude, what you would have is a basic space plane capable of both reaching and operating in space. And of course, Virgin Galactic already does this. On the other hand, attempting to engineer a space plane capable of delivering the same levels of performance or more, historically has proven to be an expensive uphill battle with little to no benefit or worse, an expensive pit. Unfortunately, the majority of space planes, while it's a step in the right direction, have not been fully developed. There has not been a continuous, consistent, concerted effort to develop and build space planes that are capable of assuring true mastery of getting into space. Why? Well, there are several reasons, really. Whilst a certain number of these space plane concepts are able to take off from a longer but otherwise conventional runway. However, there are two main factors limiting everyday use of space planes. They are drag and the need for voluminous fuel and propellant tanks. The drag represents a resistance to motion, reducing the craft's efficiency, whilst the large voluminous fuel and propellant tanks increase the craft's mass both are disastrous to a heavier-than-air vehicle attempting to reach space. Combined, these two factors nearly alone have made space plane development undesirable since other less expensive means already exist, that is, rockets. Rockets are able to place payloads into nearly any orbit the customer desires. If we could solve the many challenges associated with aerospace craft, what we would have is a proper spacecraft, one that is able to take off from the surface of a planet, reach space, and return under its own power. With a little more tweaking, it would also be capable of reaching another planet within our system. But hey, let's not get out of ourselves. So, unfortunately, the unwillingness, the lack of future vision to develop a proper spacecraft has come at a price. When we need it the most, and I mean relatively soon, it seems we have to start from scratch developing a proper spacecraft, aerospacecraft. Are there any solutions? As a matter of fact, there are indeed solutions, which brings us to the next part of the video. Wheeled or VTOL aerospace craft do not require the same level of supportive infrastructure as does rockets. Space planes are able to take off from a longer but otherwise normal runway in the same kind of weather conditions as does the airline industry. Certain VTOL craft can take off nearly anywhere in nearly any weather conditions. Even though there are other very interesting hyperfast aircraft concepts out there, the craft concept that comes closest to becoming a real space plane, real spacecraft, for achieving the most significant progress toward 
the highest altitudes and the greatest speeds is the IAX. It's an MHD assisted hypersonic wave rider aircraft powered by an air breathing scramjet engine. Initially, the IAX was intended to be a classified Soviet space plane project designed to be a new kind of global range hypersonic cruise vehicle capable of conducting a variety of missions within the mesosphere. That's between 50 and 85 kilometers. Later, it was decided that the IAX was to become, wait for it, single stage to orbit SSTO platform for launching, you guessed it, satellites into space. It's an advanced concept that is still to this day under development by Hypersonic Systems Research Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's more advanced because of its ability to control the surrounding air via a combination of systems. I'll explain. The IAX makes use of electron beams, high frequency pulse discharges, two MHD generators, one internal, one external, as well as an internal MHD accelerator. Located at the nose of the craft and leading edges of the wings are the electron beam and high frequency pulse discharge emitters. Underneath and further back but in front of the engine is located the external MHD generator which works in tandem with the second internal MHD generator. Just behind the combustor but in front of the expansion ramp nozzle is located an MHD accelerator. The high frequency pulsed discharges further ionize the already ionized and extremely hot incoming high-speed air stream, whilst the electron beams saturates the plasma with additional free electrons. The thoroughly ionized high-speed airstream becomes a kind of plasma cocoon. It's a plasma sheath that wraps itself around the craft. The plasma sheath alters the temperature gradient, which in turn alters the speed of sound, thus softening and even detaching the shock wave ahead of the craft, whilst reducing the heat load on the airframe. Why create plasma? Unionized air cannot be grabbed onto and moved by electromagnetic fields. However, if we thoroughly ionize it, the air becomes plasma and is now electromagnetically active, which allows the MHD generators and accelerator to function. Why use MHD? The MHD system utilizes the Lorentz force. It's created as a cross product of both electric current and electromagnetic fields. It is able to move matter, and in this situation, plasma. Both the internal and external MHD generators work together to create a virtual intake funnel that is much larger than the physical intake, increasing the total available intake area, allowing the craft to fly at altitudes above 35 kilometers, which is a big deal, where it is able to take in and use rarefied ionized air. And it does this by first extracting the energy from the incoming hyper or supersonic electron saturated plasma, slowing and compressing it to a dense subsonic flow just before entering the engine. After combustion, the prior extracted energy is then directly fed into the MHD accelerator, thus adding to the existing exhaust velocity, 
combined. This increases the engine's specific impulse, that is efficiency, and the craft's speed. The IAX also uses a thermal chemical reactor, TCR, to heat and crack the fuel with a catalyst. Water and ordinary kerosene are circulated throughout hot parts of the airframe, absorbing heat, which triggers a series of chemical reactions in the presence of a nickel catalyzer, called hydrocarbon steam reforming. Kerosene and water split into a new fuel, reformate, methane and carbon dioxide in the first stage, then methane and water reform in a second stage into hydrogen creating a strong endothermic reaction, that is to say the process absorbs heat instead of creating heat, thus cooling the airframe that much further. In addition to the more energetic fuel, the incoming electron-saturated plasma stream further enhances combustion effectiveness in a process known as plasma-assisted combustion, or PAC for short. As you can see, the IAX has been intelligently designed to maximize the use of heat, electrons, plasma, and other. As we stated, this is an advanced concept. The IAX, while it's closer to mastering getting into space, today we can do even better. Keep in mind, there were hyperfast aircraft and space plane concepts they could have been built in the 1970s. The IAX could have been built in the 1990s. So that begs the question, what could we do today? Rumors have it that we can already build helicopters, super and hypersonic aircraft, and even rockets. Of course we can. Remember, this video is about mastering getting into space. What is an aerospace craft? It's a high performance vehicle that is capable of both reaching and operating in space. In order to develop a real aerospace craft that is capable of the same levels of performance or greater than a rocket, we must completely rethink the aerospace craft. Can we achieve this? Of course we can. We can build a real aerospace craft today. The main reason for why there are no proper aerospace craft is a silly one. Hmm. But this video is not about that. Moving on. Completely rethinking. Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what we have done. In 2021, based in part on the IAX and the earlier work with the wingless EFE touring craft, we have nearly finished plans for a completely new kind of aerospace craft. The craft on your screen right now are creations thereof. For now, we have chosen a disc-shaped aerospace craft. Why a flying disc instead of a conventional space plane? Well, first of all, we haven't closed the door on space planes. That said, whilst we could turn a space plane into a VTOL craft for greater mobility, why would we do that when the disk provides us with an appreciable surface area by which to establish lift and exceptional stability? Now, there are two different discoidal aerospace craft configurations for us to build. First, an atmospheric dedicated craft with space travel a secondary consideration. Such craft are more efficient within an atmosphere, 
not so much in space. They can be used for search and rescue, transportation of goods, resources, and paying passengers around the globe. Second, a space dedicated craft, while less efficient within the atmosphere, is a more capable craft able to fly faster for longer periods of time needed for hops between planets or planets to moons. Ultimately, we will be building both kinds since each serve different purposes. So how are we going to achieve real aerospace craft capable of mastering getting into space? With existing specialized technologies, that's how. When we say existing, we mean just that, not some far off distant unproven future technologies. With these specialized technologies, VTOL's aerospace craft such as these are feasible, are practical. This VTOL aerospace craft is capable of the levels of performance needed to master getting into space. And this is but one of many craft that could be built today, right now. Because of these specialized technologies, whether it's a space plane or flying disc, ultimately the shape is not too critical. What we have here is the beginnings of a proper spacecraft. So, how does it all work? As we are all aware of, a conventional aircraft being propelled to move through the air generates lift because of the high-speed air moving over its wings or lifting body. If instead we move the air around the craft using one of these specialized technologies, this too will generate lift. And if that craft just happens to be a flying disc, the total surface area is greater than that of a pair of wings. As already discussed, by turning the surrounding air into plasma, an MHD propulsion system via the Lorentz force, can very easily accelerate the plasma and the surrounding air to high speeds around the entire surface area of the craft in a similar fashion as to a ion wind craft, thus generating extreme lift and, in accordance with Newton's third law, the law of action and reaction, the vehicle must move. You see, a little over 90% of the challenge of reaching space is achieving high enough velocity, a high enough speed to reach space. MHD is one of those specialized technologies that is capable of providing the levels of performance needed for reaching space. Highlighting this fact are already in existence, MHD powered, we'll call them things, capable of extreme speeds, even without sonic booms. Taking it a step closer to becoming a proper spacecraft for in-space operations, where there is no atmosphere, the craft needs maneuvering thrusters, RCS. Well, with onboard propellant and one or more non-chemical rocket engines, this will do nicely. Thankfully, for in-space operations, MHD once again comes to the rescue. With a certain amount of onboard fuel and propellant, specialized RCS plasma thrusters and aerospike engines will be able to accelerate the craft around the globe. It's a win-win situation. MHD provides the movement whilst internal lasers guarantee a steady supply of plasma for use by the MHD propulsion systems. And, of course, within an atmosphere, the air itself serves as the propellant. This is a completely new kind of aerospace craft, 
one that incorporates specialized MHD propulsion systems and more. At the top of the craft are specially regulated lasers and microwave emitters to thoroughly ionize the air into plasma. Also are located coils and electrodes to rapidly accelerate the air and plasma down over the surface of the craft. Why plasma? Well, quickly recapping from what we already talked about, there are two main reasons. Unionized air cannot be grabbed onto and accelerated. However, if we turn it into plasma, the ionized air is now electrically active and can therefore be accelerated using the Lorentz force. Second, plasma alters the temperature gradient, which in turn alters the speed of sound, generating a softer region that acts kind of like a vacuum, that is, relative to the non-ionized air. For horizontal flight, around the perimeter of the craft are 12 or more horizontally mounted plasma aerospike thrusters used to move the craft in any desired, of course, horizontal direction, whether in the atmosphere or in space. At the bottom of the craft are what we refer to as plasma neutralizers, so as to not leave a trail of ozone in the craft's wake. The main reason for the aerospace craft is to deliver payloads that is, materials into space to build a shipyard for the purpose of building starships. As well as to place our Planet Seeker telescope in orbit, which was designed to locate habitable exoplanets. This craft affords us a certain degree of mobility, especially since we can easily and effectively transport folks and materials around the planet by skimming the top of the atmosphere. This would allow us to reach nearly anywhere in the world within a relative few hours. So now the question is, what is an MHD propulsion system? MHD is short for magnetohydrodynamic, and since it was invented in 1938, it's not a new technology, which also means today specialist engineers and scientists are pretty much the only ones familiar with this technology. The original MHD devices were early no moving parts, generators, used to, of course, generate electricity directly from both thermal and kinetic energies. And since there were no moving parts, they could be used in a wide range of environments. You see, the MHD generates a special kind of force. It's a force that's able to do work against matter. Specifically, it's able to drive ionized air, which is plasma, and do so rapidly. But it is also able to extract energy from moving ionized air plasma. In more recent times, there's a French professor and scientist, Jean-Pierre Petit. He discovered a novel way of stabilizing magnetic instabilities commonly found in devices that produce strong magnetic fields, such as fusion reactors. If we put Petit's discovery to good use, once the instabilities were stabilized in the MHD generator, the efficiency of that generator went from 20%, a dismal 20%, to a more useful 60% conversion rate. Now today, other than generators, as we've already mentioned, MHD has been used to beneficially assist with certain types of combustion engines, mainly scramjet engines, as we have already explained. 
Whilst no moving parts generators definitely have their place, we're of course focused instead on how MHD can be used to propel a craft. So why MHD? Well, MHD is a handy technology. Since there is no moving parts, and since it is capable of the levels of performance that we need for reaching space, and if we configure it properly, we can achieve extreme accelerations, we can achieve extreme speeds. It has been calculated that MHD is capable of reaching Mach 20. Furthermore, MHD can be configured around a wide range of vehicle shapes. Triangles, discs, spheres, you name it. So now that begs another question. Are there any MHD craft already flying? Who knows? Time will tell. Within the next year, year and a half, we already have in motion the construction of a one to three meter prototype for testing. Well, that concludes this video. I want to thank everyone for watching. And of course, as always, keep wandering about space. Thank you.